Hello again. My name is John Beaumont. If you're joining me for the first time, I'm a wildlife conservation ambassador. I interview an animal industry professional every week, asking him or her what it takes to work with animals. These discussions are like mutual tutorials because my guest explains the personal qualities and skills needed to do what they do. The aim of the interview is to identify these skills so that you who wants to work with animals can work on your personal development, acquiring these skills so that you can stay ahead of the competition. Wildlife conservation as a career is extremely competitive, especially in the UK. So staying ahead of the competition is important because besides a degree, more land-based and further education colleges are offering more wildlife conservation and allied courses than ever before. And often these courses are oversubscribed. My next guest is Sue Sayer, arguably the UK's foremost marine conservation leader for seals. She's spent thousands of hours in the field and is a published author. I strongly suggest, if you can, please listen to the full interview to the end for tips and hacks about jobs with seals. I began by asking Sue how her own career developed. I have had two careers. Uh, one was in education. Um, I was a teacher for most of my formative career, lived in London and then moved down to Cornwall. And um, I went through a range of things. So I was geography, vocational, and then a kind of senior manager moving across roles because I didn't ever want to be a head teacher. And then in 2008, I realised I was doing that day job and I was doing the seal conservation charity work as a volunteer in the evenings. And there was no longer enough time in the day to do both. So I appreciated that lots of people could do the uh, education role and very few people could probably do the seal charity stuff. So um, I took a plunge. My partner gave me permission to take a year off. <laughs> And my excuse was that I was going to write a book, which I did. And uh, then I never went back. Um, I became self-employed for six years, maybe. And then I just realised that I wanted, if I killed over tomorrow, it would stop. And that was no good. I needed to start paying younger people to be the marine conservation leaders of the future so that they could take over if anything happened to me. Although I intend to be doing it when I'm 90, so... That's a quick resume of my career. That's a fantastic resume, actually. What was the book, Sue? Uh, Seal Secrets. Um, and it's a book about seals, obviously, and all my learning that I had about seals up to about 2010, because I started doing seals in 2000. And it's recently been updated and should be republished uh, this year, which would be the next 10 years worth of. So it'll be updated based on 20 years worth of experience and therefore hopefully be quite a bit better. Clearly, I'm talking with one of Britain's foremost seal experts. The trouble is with becoming an expert is the more you learn, the more you realise there is to learn and you have more questions than you do answers. And unfortunately, that's the position that I find myself in. So, uh, yeah, I guess I guess I know a lot more than a lot of people do about seals, having probably spent hundreds of thousands, certainly tens of thousands of hours, if not hundreds of thousands of hours, actually directly observing seals in the wild. I can sit here 24 seven photo IDing seals. So what makes our research unique? There are lots of groups around the UK who research seals and lots of researchers who research seals, but they mostly count seals. And we go beyond counting into aging and sexing. 
we look at the interactions between people and seals. So sometimes we have positive interactions with seals in terms of rescues, rehab and release. That's a positive. And those seals will have a flipper tag. So you can look at and monitor those. And uh, we have negative interactions. And there are three particular ones that we record um, currently. Disturbance. So hu in, in inadvertent human disturbance that's been done accidentally, which is a big growing issue. Um, entanglement, which I mentioned with lucky bunting, uh, that's a huge issue. We had 134 different photo ID'd entangled seals last year alone, and we have approximately 100 every year. And uh, the third thing is a newbie, and it's frisbees. Um, flying rings uh, that we play with on the beach uh, with holes in the middle. Playing with a solid disc is, a is fine because it doesn't pose a risk to marine life, but having one with a hole in the middle means that seals play with it, they get caught up in it and then can't get it off the neck. So uh, yeah, I guess um, photo ID contributes so much more data um, than counting. Do you need a degree to do what you do? So that's a very interesting question. Uh, it depends how you do what I do, I guess. I, as an ex-teacher, and this is a bit, naughty of me to say this but as an ex-teacher I don't believe in qualifications um, I don't really believe in our education system because I think it currently fails an awful lot of people um, you know the people who work in it don't get me wrong people who work in it work very hard but they are limited by the system that they're forced to work under and the regime they're forced to work under so um, I didn't need a qualification in marine biology or marine conservation to do what I do and the reason that I didn't need a qualification is because I've done it myself. <clears throat> so I started on my own. I did observation. I got to be an expert. I set up my own charity because nobody else was doing it. And then I've recruited people along the way to join us. So I didn't need it. However, most people don't do it that way. And if you want to get a job with someone else, you do need a qualification to do what you do. And uh, you don't need the qualification to do the job, but you do need the qualification to get the job. And um, it won't it won't get you through the interview, the qualification. The qualification will get you to the interview. And then all the other stuff you do will get you through the interview to get the job. So basically, you'll end up in the bin if you don't have a degree in, in a related marine degree, but um, it won't get you the job. It will only get you so far. Your personality, your personal skills, your volunteering, your demonstration of your passion, your transferable skills, all of those will be what get you the job. It was one of the reasons I appeared in a book about um, marine conservation leadership, because it's my second career. For most people, it's not a second career. And that's that's the reason why, you know, there are ways that you can do it if you haven't got a degree. Sue, what is your best seal fact, please? A seal is a mammal that breathes air, so it can suffer the bends. And in fact, if it gets trapped underwater, then, you know, it has all sorts of the complications that we would. But it has an adaptation to cope with that. Of course it does. So 15 seconds before it dives, it makes a conscious decision to dive and it pulls all the blood from its periphery into its core, uh, heart, lungs, brain. And it slows its heart rate from 120 beats a minute to perhaps as low as four and effectively stops circulation and then it dives and that's how it can dive allegedly for 12 to 20 minutes and uh, to 200 meters but more likely 70 meters some of this research is quite invasive but uh, and I don't like invasive research unless it teaches us some new science. But in this case, it did teach us some new science. So they put sensors on the seal bodies. Uh, and then when they go diving, they can monitor what's happening to the heart rate and they can monitor, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's how they know. What's the most endangered seal that you have worked with? 
Okay, so I'm unusual, I think, because I don't work with lots of seals. I only really work with UK native species. Uh, there are two UK native species. The one in the southwest that we study mostly is the grey seal. Um, and uh, the other seal is the harbour or common seal. We have had other species visit us. So we've had harp, hooded, ringed and walrus. I did work with the walrus because I had to, because, um, yeah, he would have, I don't know whether Dan talked about the walrus, but uh, he caused quite a few problems for the local community and as a result um, became a very inconvenient and might have disappeared had he not been looked after, particularly by British Divers Marine Life Rescue. Um, but so out of the two native species that we have, grey seals are globally rare. A, th a third of the world's population of grey seals live in the UK. We still have more red squirrels in the UK than we do red uh, than we do grey seals. So even though this is a stronghold for them, there are not that many here. You know, I don't know how many of your listeners will have seen a red squirrel, but probably not that many. So there aren't that many. Therefore, there aren't that many grey seals either, despite having um, a significant proportion of the world's population. There are five global populations of harbour seals, whereas there is the grey seals are limited to the North Atlantic, and that's why they're globally rare. What is your view of seal research and conservation today, both in the wild and if appropriate, in captivity. We lag way behind terrestrial species um, because humans have much more experience of land-based stuff. They're much better at conserving it and have a longer history of doing so. Um, in terms of marine conservation, um, you know, it's been out of sight and out of mind for a long time. Modern science now tells us that um, top predators, cetaceans, seals, seabirds, are essential to keep a marine ecosystem in balance and to keep the biodiversity of the marine ecosystem, which of course fishers totally rely on. But a fisher doesn't ever see a dolphin or a lobster eating a fish, but they do see a seal. So they eat more tons of sand eels than any other single species. Most of the fish they eat is tiny. It were the biggest fish that they can swallow underwater whole is a mackerel. Um, but anything bigger they have to bring to the surface to eat. And that's when fishers see them. So the fishers see them with the biggest, best fish. And it's given them a very bad reputation. And as a result of that, um, conserve, conserving seals has been more controversial than the other species. And that's why um, I think seals are made a scapegoat for the sea for all sorts of things and get blamed for things that they don't do I think there's an awful lot of work to do my hope that I'm really pleased about is that the statutory agencies Natural England Marine Management Organisation DEFRA are now all over the marine environment and um, doing great conservation work and have seals on their agenda um, thanks to the seal alliance um, of which I chair their existing working group uh, and it makes such a difference so I believe we're getting there and we've made some great strides but we lag behind other species at the moment. So how do you see seal research and conservation changing over the next 10 years? Oh gosh, that's a very interesting question. Um, there is a lot more research being done on seals, but much of it is invasive and um, one of the things that uh, we've recently published a paper about post-release monitoring of seals from captivity, and it demonstrates that they survive and do things that normal wild seals do. And a lot of researchers will tell you that they won't research captive seals in the wild or in captivity because they're not wild seals. Well, I would say now, if, we, if we've got a seal in captivity, and we're releasing it into the wild, we should be using it for research because our research seems to suggest that in the ways we can detect, which is not all the ways, but, you know, in terms of movements and breeding, they seem to be doing wild seal behaviour. So um, I think we should be making better use of that. Um, Technology is obviously great. Um, we currently do photo ID by eye, uh, relying on our brains to do it. Um, 
And actually, we will always do that because it gives that emotional connection I was talking about to seals on your local patch and therefore you become an ambassador for them. And that's key. But uh, we miss IDs and we miss matches between catalogues, between places. Uh, so photo ID software will, will become the future and we'll have an autom a place, automated stuff will have a place along with the eye stuff and the manual stuff. But the main way, I think, is going to be in remote stuff. Um, one day I saw this with penguins and I thought it was super cool. Penguins running along a path and um, cameras on either side of that path because they have a set route way that they follow. And penguins have got an arc here with black blobs on their white chest. And the camera takes a photo and then goes penguin 62, penguin 45. And one day, all of our beaches that are seal haul outs will have remote sensors on either side of it. The seals will have some sort of subcutaneous teeny weeny little sensor and it will be white back seas just arrived on the beach yeah white back seas faffing around with ghost again yeah those two are together you know that kind of stuff and i think you know science will take us to some amazing places won't it because the competencies of technology are phenomenal and we're just beginning to get to grips with technology there's a lot more to come So, what effect is climate change having on seals? Massive effect on seals, not surprisingly. Um, the first way that I think, um, the, the way that's obvious now is um, extreme weather events causing storms during the pupping season. So, pupping season in the UK is August to December. And um, we often get a lot of storms in October through to January, February sometimes. And um, these storms uh, cause massive ground swells and waves. If you hit a pupping beach at high tide on a spring high tide with a massive storm, all the pups get washed off the beach and separated from their mothers and then they're doomed to die. So we had this in 2000 and, uh, 2017 with Storm Brian, peak, peak tide, spring tide and math peak popping season. Worst, worst scenario, really. And 50% um, of pups and 75% of pups got washed off Scoma and the Isle of Man where they were counting pups. We weren't counting pups on the Sillies, but I reckon every pup on the Sillies, which are quite low lying, would have been washed off in that storm and separated from its mother. So... Um, we had a you know, huge mortality of pups in 2017, but what surprised us unexpectedly was the impact in 2018, because in 2017, the mums hadn't mated, because what seals do is they, they feed their pups for three weeks and they mate as they wean, but they are emaciated and can't sustain that pregnancy until they get fat and fit, so they delay implantation, and then pup 12 months later. So what happens is if you don't feed your pup for three weeks, your hormones are now messed up. So your hormones are not in the right place to mate at the end of that three weeks. So a lot of our mums didn't get pregnant that year. And in 2018, we had a 46 percent drop in pup numbers compared to 2017. And we attribute that to Storm Brian, which was an extreme weather event linked to climate change. Um, I don't know whether you heard about Storm Arwen on the East Coast in 20, uh, earlier this year, 2022, there were 800 white coat pups floating dead in the water off the East Coast after Storm Arwen. So that's the most obvious way currently. The second way is coastal erosion. Extreme weather events cause our coast to, to um, you know, collapse at an increasing and accelerating rate. Um, that happens over pupping beaches and haul out beaches and in seal caves, just the same as it does everywhere else. So um, seals get killed if they're if there's a rock fall and they're on the beach, they get killed. And um, thirdly, and perhaps a little bit less expectedly, well, there's four actually. The third one is to do with ground swells. So if fishers haven't anticipated the storm or not watched the weather forecast and their gear is still out, it gets lost. 
So that's a huge amount of gear now in the marine environment that now is a risk to marine life. So entanglement rates go up hugely because there's more ghost gear in the water. And as a result of the more, sco- more ghost gear, it's there for decades and hundreds of years because it's made of plastic and doesn't rot. And the fourth way is warming seas. Uh, we've been having more um, toxic algal blooms. Um associated with rising sea temperatures and those toxic algal blooms contain a a chemical called domoic acid and domoic acid has been associated and found in seals and it messes with their neurology and it's hideous to watch it's very distressing because they just look like they're swimming when they're on land and they're out out of it completely so yeah that's four ways um that we think already having probably quite a big impact on seals. Sue, what jobs are there available working with seals? Um, That's a very good question. We have a few jobs uh, working with us. So we currently have um, three rangers working with us. We have a marine stories ranger. They do social media and social media for conservation is utterly critical um, because it's how you grow your audience. What we've perhaps being guilty of doing is talking to people within our own bubble and we need to grow the audience and get outside our environmental bubble we need to get beyond the people who know about wildlife into a new audience second ranger is activities and administration so she runs all our events and does an awful lot of stuff behind the scenes and runs our online shop Uh, you know online shop is one of the key ways that we fund our rangers it's one of our three funding streams along with donations and an adoption scheme while still support an adoption scheme and uh, the main one who we've had the longest is Sarah and she's our sanctuaries at seas ranger and she organizes all our um, systematic surveys our organized ones with volunteers we have three boat surveys and a Lou Island survey and she organizes our quarterly census Um, But we have had a research ranger before now and uh, research rangers support students. And we've had um, uh, creativity and activity ranger. So we had a designer for a year working, you know, really bringing all our design work up to scratch. Um, In other areas with other organisations, there are um, marine marine officers who um, will do all sorts of conservation work from behind the scenes stuff desk based stuff but also then going out and doing events so we we do school events uh, you know, i'm thinking of organizations like the cornwall wildlife trust lots of the wildlife trusts do school events and public events so there's jobs doing that um, there are jobs for um to work with developers so um I'm thinking about observers. A lot of developments like offshore wind or cabling require marine mammal observers um, and you train to be a marine mammal observer and then you can get a job with one of these companies doing the mitigation work with marine mammals. Uh, And then there's university stuff, you know, um, doing doing degrees, postdoc stuff um, and then um, becoming lecturers. There's that kind of thing um yeah i guess i guess that's my experience of the kind of jobs that are available what advice sue can you offer to people wanting to work with seals um unfortunately and i find this a little bit sad it's all about volunteering to start with um i I think it's sad because you know my generation never had to do that they were able to go out and earn from scratch But these days, that doesn't seem to be possible. So um, building up your portfolio as early as you possibly can to A, demonstrate passion and B, demonstrate that you've got initiative to grab opportunities and to put your money where your mouth is and uh, show that you're willing to give. Uh, So gaining a breadth of experience is really critical. Um, understanding that it's the transferable skills that are really important um being able to learn a life i know i learn stuff every course i run to teach people still i've got one running with the field studies council uh, discovering seals every course i run i learn something so lifelong learning is critical your ability to learn is the most important asset you have so having the knowledge 
isn't as important as having the learning skills. It's really critical. When you go for a job interview, there are three things the employer will look for. The first one is, are you qualified to do the job, which speaks to one of the answers I gave earlier. The second thing is, will you be motivated to do the job? So do you have passion, desire, drive, initiative to actually make the job happen and be effective at the job? And the third thing they're looking for is somebody who's going to fit in with the team. They don't want a personality who's going to disrupt the dynamics of the team that was already there. They've got to rub along with the team. It's fine to be challenging at work, but you need to be challenging in a way that is um, inclusive and acceptable. And it's also okay to be different because you need to be complementary to the team, but you still have to work with the personalities who are already in that team. What advice can you offer somebody wanting to work with SEALs? Um, Okay, so um, lifelong learning would be absolutely crucial. Um, I've just uh, finished a course that I run for the FSC, Discovering SEALs, and um, I learnt loads of stuff on that course from other people, as well as delivering the course to teach people. you know, learning things every day, every day is a school day. I think that's really key. You have to understand as well that you can't always be right. And SEALs prove that to me all the time. So I will come out with uh, SEALs do this. And then the next time I go survey and they'll do something different. And it's because they're like humans. They're all mavericks and different. And they, you know, they, they are all uniquely different and individuals. And I love that. Every rule has got an exception. Uh, You have to remember why you're doing it. So, uh, you know, that's really key. Go back to your passion and, um, yeah, come back to passion. Um, If in doubt, cut people in, not out. So if you have an opportunity and you're thinking, should I copy them into that email? Should I tell them about it? If you're not sure, tell them, because that will be of benefit in the future. Understand that you have your own limitations and make sure that you, if you have a limitation, that you find somebody who can help you achieve what you think you're less good at. Um, encourage people to promote themselves you know people need we are really delicate beings we need a lot of support and encouragement and thanking people and valuing people is the most important thing all of us can do is make other people smile so being humble and then in terms of the work it's uh, try your best at all times keep it simple Um, be prepared to become addicted if you do anything like photo ID, uh, use it or lose it, um, you know, technology skills, um, facts, all that stuff. I've just taught myself a new fact about seal noses and I have to keep reminding myself that uh, they're turbinates. Otherwise, I'm going to forget what that word is. Um, make it count. Do stuff that's worthwhile. Um Work with the agencies. You have to work with all the partners and the agencies, statutory and uh, global ones. It's really important. And then plan for not being there. So one day I'm not going to be here. I do not want it to all stop. So I need everyone else to have all the skills, the words, the approach, the tone, the the body language. They need to have all of that in order to be able to carry on uh, when I'm not around. So, yeah, that kind of stuff. But I've got a statement that I would like to read out because it's what I tell all young people about careers. So I'm going to read it because otherwise I'll mess it up. Uh, Find out what you love doing. Research careers linked with this. And if there aren't any, set up an organisation to do what you love. Surround yourself with interesting, highly competent people who you can learn from lifelong and understand that people are always your most precious and important resource and that they all need handling with emotional intelligence. Aim to get good at everything, even the things that you find hard and challenging. That was absolutely brilliant. I love that. Can you please suggest a career plan? for somebody wanting to work with SEALs? Okay, yes, I think I can. Um, so start off, um, if you if you really are into SEALs, start off by getting to a place on holiday where you can go and see them. Sometimes the best places to go and see them are in captivity. So here we have the Cornish SEAL Sanctuary. Um, or, you know, there's plenty of places around the UK. There are lots of rehab centres around the UK go and visit one because that is the only place where you can get up close and personal to a seal 
and not have a significant dis a significantly negative impact on them. Um, and then if you can travel to a place where you can actually go and look at them in the wild uh, and just observe and think about what you're looking at and try and work out what's going on and think of them. I know people call this anthropomorphizing, but in science, anthropomorphism has become less of a negative thing than it used to be. It's much more acceptable because we're beginning to realize we're not the only intelligent beings out there. The animals have uh, incredible abilities. I learned the other day that robins, the bird, the little bird, a robin, has facial recognition and can recognize one human being from another. So, um, you know, think about the motivations that you might see behind the behavior that you're observing and then research organizations on your local patch that you can or, you know, if you have to travel, do so on holiday or whatever. Find a way of doing it and go and uh, visit some of these places. Um, offer your services. Um, write speculative letters explaining why you would like to be able to volunteer there. It's easier to volunteer locally. Um, the reason being you're more reliable, more frequent and more dependable. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the Cornish Seal Sanctuary in particular. They'll have interns from upcountry, but there's a very long waiting list. If you live around the, around the corner and you can be there if they need you on call and on demand, you're much more likely to get a placement. So that helps. Um, so get your foot indoors put your face out there everywhere. So our very first ranger, our first ever paid ranger was called Marion. And she just appeared everywhere. You know, I was at a meeting or a conference somewhere. So that's the other thing is get involved in other organisations around your interest in SEALs and go to events. She was just at all the events that, that I went to. And then, then I realised what her name was and I started calling her Marion. And before I knew it, Marion was working in the office here and then we were paying her because we both wrote the funding bid to pay her. So, you know, you can make stuff happen. So put your foot in the door, get your face about, put your face in people's faces and make sure you use your name so they know what you, who you are so they can refer to you and then start doing applications. And I would advise that you get somebody in the industry who you've come across previously through your volunteering to look at your application before you send it in and then don't be precious about it if they put um, track changes and corrections and revisions all over it don't be upset don't take it personally it's hard to write a good application so get some feedback from somebody who knows and can help you um, and then put in the application and don't expect to get the job you know, go in with an open mind. It's a learning experience. An interview it isn't your best chance of getting a job. It's a learning experience. And if you go in with that, you'll be much, much more relaxed and you will be yourself. And my top tip for an interview is it is not about questions and answers. It is about conversation. People only ask questions to prompt a conversation on a theme so you just go in and you talk about the theme that they have asked the question about and um, then you'll feel more relaxed and go and enjoy it and smile and be yourself because then you've got a much better chance of getting the job and you know then a few interviews down the line hopefully you'll have a job and if you're still not getting the job go back to somebody to ask for help and advice with interviews there is no better opportunity than sitting in front of your bedroom mirror, answering interview questions and appreciating what you look like to an interviewer to understand how you can improve. So, you know, think about all those things. And then when you get in a job, if you find it hard and you don't really like it because it's not what you expected because you've had to start at the bottom and work your way up, put up with it. And give it a good few months before you decide you're going to leave. Hopefully you'll have changed your mind by then. Um, because unfortunately, we all have to start at the bottom and make cups of tea. And then we progress on to things that are more meaningful and valuable. But offer to go out with the boss doing whatever the boss does, carrying the bags or doing whatever, you know. And then you start to build up the experience that you need to, prom to get promotion. That was brilliant advice. Sue, is there anything you'd like to add? 
I would like to just represent seals a little bit and talk about the main threats that they face in the wild, because these are the drivers for the conservation work that I do. These are the things that push me, really. And I'm just going to have a quick check so I don't forget anything. Um, basically, um, fisheries accidental bycatch is a major issue. In uh, 2015 alone, there were allegedly, well, no, actually, it's not alleged. It's data, DEFRA data says there were 310 dead by court seals around Devon and Cornwall in 2015 alone. This is a massive issue. We need to work with fisheries to solve the issue. Entanglement is the live version of that. So, you know, you get caught up in gear that's been lost in the sea. Anything looped is a risk. Uh, flying rings are now a risk because they've got a hole in it. So, uh, you know, all of that kind of work. That's all awareness raising work. And we need to do a lot for that. Uh, climate change. So trying to persuade people to do environmentally friendly things. We have a thing with loads of eco tips of things you can do at school, home, work and play uh, in order to help the environment. Think about what you chuck down your toilet. Do you put bleach down your toilet? If you do, it ends up in the sea. It's not a friendly chemical. Use plant based products. Eat local line caught fish. Good seafood guide fish. Um, Make sure that you are picking up your litter and taking it, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, we do microplastics research and microplastics are terrifying. They have been found in every trawl that we've done for a global organisation called Trawl Share. Um, they come in seven different types. I won't go through them all. Um, but microplastics from the sea have been found in fish, seals, seabirds, cetaceans, all sorts and now they've been found in us they've been found in our lungs and the latest research shows that we have microplastics in our blood that's terrifying that's kind of leading to potential strokes and heart issues for the future for all of us so microplastics if you wear a fleece <clears throat> using a microplastic trap bag every time you wash your fleece is absolutely fundamentally important google them um, disturbance is the easy win we can all do something about this tomorrow by pointing the finger at us and saying, are we 100 metres away from a seal uh, or at least on the coast path away from the seal? It might be less than 100 metres that way, but because you're on a cliff top. But either way, give seals space. You can't take a selfie with a seal. You can't go anywhere close to it without impacting it. If it's looking at you, it knows you're there and it's already been woken up from a sleep. You know what it feels like to be stared at. If somebody you don't know stares at you for 15 seconds or worse, five minutes, which I observed yesterday, you know how uncomfortable that makes you feel. Seals are disturbed up to every 19 minutes. If you were woken up every 19 minutes in your sleep, um, you wouldn't feel very good the following morning. We're having a really bad impact. So point the finger at yourself and say, I'm 100 metres away. And if you are, the problem will go away. And uh, yeah, just think seal. That would be my top tip. Try and work out what it's like to think seal or cetacean or seabird or hedgehog or fox, whatever it is you love. Just try and get in their heads and then you will be able to help conserve them best. So it's been inspirational. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel, Sue Sayer. You're very welcome. Thanks for having a Practical Animals channel.